Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our Alta Nova Group uh, webinar talking about global monitoring of uh, high voltage GIS. Uh, I'm Stefan Heberer. I'm the vice president uh, system sales of the Alta Nova Group. Uh, and I was uh, tech camp and Alta Nova now since uh, five years. Uh, before that, uh, I have been uh, working with ABB and for 15 years and Qualitrol for four or five years. Uh, uh, so I'm around in the market for quite some time. Uh, some of you might know me uh, and I'm happy to learn you and learn more about you. So I have on my side uh, Milko Meloni. He is the head of project management, uh, very experienced and skilled person uh, in TechEmp uh, since uh, many, many years, almost since the beginning of the company. And uh, Milko uh, is uh, in the chat room where you can find him if you have any questions. Uh, we would like to ask you to raise these questions uh, in the chat room, in this question section that you have uh, uh, in your in your uh, computer. So if you have questions, like I said, please write it down and Milko will be happy to answer this. This is for the sake uh, to have a fluent uh, uh, presentation uh, uh, with little interruptions uh, so that we can uh, stay within the given time uh, of one hour. Um, this topic today is uh, a, a topic which becomes more and more of importance that we see and more and more customers are considering uh, 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 by protecting their assets uh, and in particular the high voltage GIS uh, to focus not only on partial discharge which almost is a kind of a standard nowadays for a high voltage GIS uh, of 22 kV, 222, 220 kV and above uh, 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 even more now to consider also circuit breaker monitoring and SF6 monitoring. Yeah. Um, okay. So the whole system of such a global monitoring for, for, for high voltage GIS consists of obviously partial discharge monitoring, uh, circuit breaker monitoring, um, including the battery system uh, and a complete SF6 monitoring of the GIS. Um, it is looking into activities related to partial discharge. It monitors the circuit breaker operation. It gives you an idea about a leakage uh, uh, or any other disorientation of the SF6 system. Uh, and the functionality of the battery. Most often you find reasons for all the results, uh, 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 the, the things resulting in defects uh, are starting already at manufacturing sites, uh, some errors in manufacturing, uh, like equipment, faulty equipment, uh, faulty disc pushings, uh, Things can happen also during shipping uh, of the equipment to the site. It can happen also during assembly, uh, even though the, the system has been tested fully in the factory, but still you would have uh, issues during assembly. All the aging factors like ingress of moisture during operation, um, gas leakages, uh, circuit breaker malfunctions, or even battery malfunctions uh, can uh, um, cause uh, severe failures uh, of the system and all of that is about to avoid obviously the severe failures. So. Let's start with partial discharge monitoring. So partial discharge monitoring like I mentioned already in the beginning is probably the most common monitoring for high voltage GIS uh, like I said 220 kV and the buffer. It's more or less kind of a common standard uh, and apply it uh, on almost every GIS installed globally. Uh, how does Altanova Group apply and approach the pa partial discharge monitoring uh, in high voltage GIS? Uh, Altanova Group uh, is benefiting from the development of the TF map, uh, which has been uh, uh, invented uh, by TechEmp uh, many years ago and which is helping uh, to identify and differentiate the different phenomena of PD. 
But what is the TF map as a patented technology of tech imp? Just as a general introduction into partial discharge, as a quick overview, uh, most of them, most of you might have heard that already. According to IEC 60 to 70, uh, partial discharge is a localized electrical discharge uh, occurring in uh, some of the insulating materials uh, that can occur or not occur adjacent to a conductor uh, or insulations between conductors. Uh, so we are facing different kinds of PDs. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the PD is related to the aging of the insulation. The PD is a cause and effect of insulation degradation. And what happens if there is, if you're confronted with degradation of insulation, you finally face a fatal breakdown of the asset. The diagnostic marker, the partial discharge, uh, is uh, kind of like what I said this uh, uh, ele localized electrical discharge uh, and as a diagnostic marker for local defects. Um, it is an aging factor in all kinds of organic materials and it's often seen as the fastest aging mechanism uh, in an insulating material. And of course, at the end, it's most harmful uh, as a cause of a breakdown. Usually in an in a laboratory environment, a PD pattern would be acquired in a three-dimensional histogram uh, consisting of frequency of occurrence, uh, magnitude, and phase. But to do the interpretation of such a three-dimensional histogram, uh, uh, as it is very difficult uh, and uh, almost impossible, there is a convention in the industry to use a PRPD pattern uh, to make it a two-dimensional pattern. This two-dimensional pattern uh, uh, is, uh, uh, uses a color code uh, for the repetition rate. Uh, so depending on the repetition of pulses related to amplitude and to phase, uh, uh, it, you find a different color, uh, which gives you the intensity. As we know, the different patterns represent different kind of PD phenomena. So, every kind of shape you can associate and you will find that also in the literature you can associate a certain pd phenomena to and this is uh, giving you an idea of the harmfulness of the partial discharge you find inside of your asset however it life is not so easy as it is in books in learning books what you usually see is a very mixed pattern where it's difficult to find individual kind of patterns who give you an idea of what kind of uh, PD phenomena you're looking at. And here comes the invention of uh, TechIM, which is the so-called TF map, uh, uh, which clusterizes uh, the different phenomena. So there is a transition uh, from the pattern into a classification map, uh, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which represents equivalent time lengths and equivalent bandwidths. By doing so, you will find all of a sudden all these kind of PD phenomena in different clusters. You are now able to evaluate and to analyze the different clusters one by one. So you will see that if you analyze one particular cluster, which the software uh, provided uh, will allow you to to to, uh, re, uh, to to exclude from the others and then uh, do an individual individual analysis on this uh, uh, and you then can identify if you're talking about noise or a different kind of phenomena as you can see here so having this as a basis uh, for the monitoring uh, this allows you if you install the system uh, on the monitoring site during commissioning to identify the areas of partial discharge the, uh, and the areas of noise. So in that respect, you can eliminate immediately from the beginning the area of noise from the acquisition so that you can avoid uh, false alarms uh, coming from noises. This altogether allows you to significantly reduce the false alarms by this identification, as I just tried to explain to you. 
by eliminating the noise from the acquisition from the beginning, the areas of noise, but then also taking into consideration the trending, uh, the QMAX, um, and the repetition of certain clusters, as you have seen before in the TF map, uh, the repetition of these clusters, which represent an, uh, a steady state of, of, of a PD phenomena. What does it mean for our GIS? Uh, we know that little PD activities can be tolerated in GIS. Um, there is a very low level only possible and allowed uh, to uh, exist inside the, the GIS. Uh, otherwise, you would already lead uh, or, or run into a, a severe failure of the PDS. So in, in the experience, uh, there is a small amount of PD is from free conducting particles is harmless. Uh, uh, well, as strong PD activities from a floating component will result in a failure in a matter of weeks or months already. Yeah. So it depends also on the kind of PD uh, that you're looking at, the kind of source for PD uh, you're looking into, which uh, will uh, uh, give you an indication of uh, a failure sooner or later. What are typical defects uh, in uh, High voltage GIS, uh, so you're looking into moving particles, uh, 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 protrusions or scratches uh, uh, can be a source uh, for PD. Uh, you might, might find uh, fixed particles uh, on insulating surfaces, floating electrodes, uh, uh, loose non floating electrodes, uh, which may uh, cause PD activities. Uh, you might might find voids in solid insulation materials like the dish bushings. Uh, you might find delaminations, or even uh, during installation, uh, it has also been seen that uh, they're just forgotten tools uh, inside the GIS. So here you have a view on uh, uh, on what kind of uh, parts can cause PD once more. Protrusions we talked about, the particles uh, fixed to an insulator surface, uh, free moving particles, or electrically uh, electrically floating parts. Uh, floating electrodes. Uh, you find large between P partial discharge between a floating electrode and adjacent electrode, uh, they produce acoustic pressure waves of great energy. So this is something in the magnitude of 1000 nanocoulombs uh, uh, plus minus. Uh, so a very, very strong PD, uh, which can be easily detected uh, by different means of sensing, uh, even by acoustic sensors. Uh, uh, or non-loose uh, loose or non-floating electrodes are generating usually PD pulses correlated to twice the frequency of the test voltage. Uh, so there you find an, a, a correlation uh, uh, and, and a possible identification of those uh, through this knowledge. Uh, um, and so these acoustic signals are propagating from the defect to the enclosure where they can be detected. You also find voids and delamination uh, uh, in the epoxy uh, uh, discs, for example, uh, uh, they absorb high frequency uh, acoustic uh, energy strongly. Uh, so acoustic partial discharge detection in that case is not effective. Uh, so that's uh, the, the PD magnitude can be a few picoclumps, so very small, depending on the size and position of the void. Uh, so the electrical detection is uh, generally the one you're going to use. Uh, Impact uh, of free conducting uh, free conducting particles. So we're talking about moving moving particles here on the enclosure or an insulating surface uh, uh, cause an easily detectable acoustic signal. Uh, so also here you are in the range of two to ten uh, picocoulombs, uh, uh, um, and in that way uh, all types uh, of uh, partial discharge usually uh, with nowadays systems can be detected. Yeah. We have electrode protrusions, uh, uh, corona from a protrusion uh, on an electrode generates pressure, which can be detected. Uh, uh, and here you have uh, a sensitivity, um, usually better than two picocoulombs, uh, uh, depending on the location uh, and the distance uh, 
uh, between sensor and the defector. Fixed particles on insulating surfaces, uh, uh, such defects can be detected uh, if they produce a corona. So, uh, which is usually the case uh, uh, when you find this. Uh, and uh, here also the sensitivity is somewhere in the range of uh, two picocoulombs. What kind of sensors are used uh, in high voltage GIS usually? More and more uh, less state of the art uh, of uh, any producer of high voltage GIS uh, 220 kV and above is uh, uh, pre-installed internal UHF sensors. So the 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 uh, uh, predominant technology of monitoring high voltage GIS uh, is UHF sensors. Uh, you can use also external sensors uh, on unshielded epoxy spacers. You have shielded epoxy spacers with small dielectric apertures, unshielded uh, spacers at cable terminations, and also dielectric glass windows. I will show you some examples now in the following. Here you have uh, pictures uh, of internal UHF sensors. Uh, so they are usually installed uh, uh, inside the gas chambers nowadays uh, uh, by the OEM and pre-configured by the OEM. Also, the locations of uh, these sensors are defined by the OEM in the most suitable way uh, for the GIS and most suitable way to detect the PD inside the GIS. If no internal sensors are available, on, on the Xboxy spacers, um, you can add uh, UHF horn antennas from external in order to listen into the GIS uh, uh, from these spaces. That has also been proven as a very uh, good way of monitoring and measuring PD inside high voltage GIS. Then you have also the, the shielded epoxy spacers with small dielectric apertures. Uh, they, in the same way, you can apply from the outside uh, um, UHF sensors, uh, uh, which have also been proven to work very well. Uh, on the pics, on the two pictures below, uh, you can see um, maybe it's better uses. You can see here uh, this is the area where you can apply the external sensor. And here you have an example of an already installed external sensors on a high voltage GIS. It's by the way, very easy to install. Uh, also later on on an existing uh, GIS, which has no internal sensors uh, and where you can find these uh, kind of spacers, uh, which will then allow you at any time later on also to do the installation uh, of the uh, UH, external UHF sensors. Uh, here you find also another uh, example of an installation at a cable termination. And uh, on cable terminations, you have sometimes two options. You can either use, as you can see here, UHF sensors. Uh, uh, installed uh, close to the termination um, or you can even also use HFCT sensors installed on the uh, earthing lead uh, uh, at the cable termination. So there, are, there you have uh, both options uh, um, and both options are commonly equally uh, good in terms of detecting partial discharge at this location. If your GIS is equipped uh, with inspection windows, glass windows, uh, and uh, some of the GIS are, uh, and if in this case also you there are no uh, suitable spaces available and no internal sensors, obviously, then the other alternative is to use spiral UHF antennas, uh, which will be put against the glass window and use and, and uh, looking inside of the GIS. So this is also a way 
uh, where you can achieve good sensitivity. However, um, not very many uh, you, GIS are equipped with these kind of inspection windows and also the location and the distribution of this inspection window sometimes is not ideal. Then. But for the areas where you can observe, uh, uh, this is also a very good method uh, to monitor and to test uh, for partial discharge inside of the high voltage GIS. Here you find a typical layout uh, on, on how you would uh, apply a permanent monitoring system. Uh, you have your bay uh, and on your base uh, you have uh, a, a predefined, we assume here now, you have already a, a GIS with internal sensors. The manufacturers define the locations of the sensors and that's where you connect uh, your acquisition unit to. Uh, so that would be a typical bay with uh, seven uh, PD sensors uh, uh, and also here you would uh, on top of that you would have uh, a number like 15 SF6 sensors one for each chamber. The monitoring system is comprised of uh, a connection to either an internal sensor or external sensors um, so where then you have a number uh, of, of parts uh, inside the the acquisition units, which will be close to the GIS in the GIS room, uh, in the GIS hall, uh, uh, and an acquisition unit consists of uh, a set of frequency shifters, uh, uh, or sometimes it's called preconditioners. Uh, 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 then, then you have multiplexers, uh, uh, and you have acquisition units uh, 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 ranging up from uh, uh, three to twelve channels uh, per acquisition unit. Uh, so all these acquisition units will then be connected via a fiber optic ring uh, to a central server, which is requiring all the data uh, uh, and also processing all the data coming from the acquisition units. Here you would see a typical uh, design uh, or a layout of an acquisition box uh, containing all the technical uh, devices uh, required for the acquisition. Uh, as you can see, it's installed uh, close to the GIS uh, in the GIS hall uh, and connected um, by means of uh, coaxial cables uh, to the UHF sensors uh, uh, installed in the GIS. The acquisition unit uh, typically have the bandwidth between 16 kilohertz and 30 megahertz uh, with a fast sampling rate of 100 mega samples per second uh, uh, and can take up to six channels uh, and with two acquisition units uh, in one uh, uh, box uh, you can go up to the mentioned 12 channels. This is to conclude the part of the partial discharge monitoring, and I would like now to come to the circuit breaker monitoring. Why is circuit breaker monitoring becoming more and more popular? We have already now in the last years uh, completed more and more projects, and uh, we're seeing more and more inquiries and discussions with customers about circuit breaker monitoring. Uh, that has to do that the uh, circuit breakers are coming into age, and also that customers have identified circuit breaker as actually also one of the critical items in the switchgear, actually in the whole network. Because it's a highly critical device for protection of the system, because without the circuit breaker, how would you interrupt the fault? So you have to interrupt the power flow and you have to be sure that you have a reliable system that in case, and this is obviously not the routine case, but it's uh, the unusual case, but it is happening, we all know this, in case of a short circuit, you need to be able to interrupt fast and quicker. So you need to rely on that. Uh, it has been also seen, and this is also part of the motivation, that indeed maloperation of breakers is one of the most common root cause for failures. And the most particular item is here, I would say, the reliable performance required after a long period of inactivity. That's exactly the core of, of what is happening. Sometimes a breaker is maybe active once in two years. 
because it uh, usually is operating under normal grid conditions. There is no disturbance, uh, there is no short circuit, there is no fault, there is no need for braking. And so the breaker is sleeping and inactive, inactive for long periods of time. And then all of a sudden, when the fault is coming, it needs to work with all it, its mechanical devices, uh, uh, which requires lubricants, uh, which can age, uh, uh, um, and you name it. There was moving parts uh, uh, for the tribe, for the for the close open uh, or open close open uh, uh, sequences. Uh, uh, so so it needs to be very reliable. So that's why customers more and more thinking about uh, monitoring. Uh, the circuit breaker is under the influence of ambient conditions like temperature, humidity, dust. Uh, um, there is over time a deterioration of mechanical and electrical wear and tear of the contacts also. Um, and monitoring will also allow you to identify the performance or read the performance of the circuit breaker under normal conditions, under real life conditions. Whereas if you do the services, uh, you do it very often under offline testing situations, uh, which are not equal to the real life operating conditions. So. And last but not least, of course, also here customers want to understand the benefits from moving from plant to condition-based maintenance. So. What parameters are usually monitored uh, in uh, and uh, if you monitor a circuit breaker, so so you monitor open and close times, uh, you monitor coil currents, uh, uh, you monitor the breaker velocity, the feeder currents, motor currents, heater currents. You monitor the breaker status. Uh, I square T is very important. The sum uh, of of the breaking currents. Uh, you monitor the SF6 inside of the breaker uh, and uh, the battery voltage uh, as an option also, uh, because it's also important if you lose uh, auxiliary power supply uh, for a fault that uh, you still need to be able to operate. So here on that slide there, uh, you can see kind of the profiles which are recorded uh, during uh, the monitoring. Uh, so you talk about monitoring the travel movement, uh, you talk about uh, monitoring the coil currents, the feeder currents, uh, and of course also the breaker contact, uh, contacts. Uh, these parameters are constantly compared uh, uh, to uh, parallel events. Uh, if they are uh, constant in their behavior uh, or if they're de deviating in the behavior, uh, and secondly, also, uh, if they are within the limits uh, provided uh, by the OEM, usually the OEMs giving uh, parameters uh, in which the uh, circuit breaker has to operate. Uh, and this uh, monitoring uh, and evaluating of these parameters will allow you to understand uh, um, if you're within these given limits uh, or if you're outside. Uh. The same is for travel sensors, uh, also very important uh, that uh, you can use the travel sensor uh, um, to be, uh, uh, to, to calculate uh, uh, the speed uh, of, of, of the, the breaker and which also is giving you an idea uh, of uh, the, um, yeah, the, the quality uh, of your operating unit. On top of that, uh, also the SS6 inside uh, uh, the breaker uh, is monitored uh, because the breaking performance is very much depending on the temperature, um, the dew point, uh, uh, and density and pressure uh, uh, inside the breaking chamber. If there are some deviations, uh, if you lose pressure, uh, if you see moisture coming in and changing the dew point, uh, um, if the temperature is increasing, you understand that you have an issue inside the breaker, which might uh, uh, have an impact on your next uh, switching. So in that case, you are monitoring uh, uh, the trending, the trending of uh, um, most often the density, uh, but also the, the, the pressure uh, is being monitored. Uh, 
uh, and then of course finally you will get a warning if certain parameters uh, that you measure are outside uh, the recommended values uh, recommended by the OEM. Battery voltage measurement um, uh, can also not be neglected, as I mentioned before, uh, because uh, that is also an important part uh, of the system. Uh, if you lose auxiliary power, you need still to be able to operate uh, uh, at the minimum. Uh, so, um, so you cannot, uh, if, if you have lost power, you need to rely fully on the battery. Uh, it's to still supply you with the necessary uh, power uh, to operate the circuit breakers. So here, in that case, uh, you can also monitor uh, voltage trends uh, and maximum and minimum voltage uh, uh, and compare that uh, to also here uh, thresholds uh, provided by the supplier of uh, the battery. So what happens in faulty conditions? Uh, the circuit breaker, he measures uh, the parameter outside the OEM's recommendation. As I said, uh, the currents uh, uh, um, and also the velocity uh, of the transducers, uh, they, they are given by the OEM, the parameters, and you constantly compare these parameters uh, uh, with the parameters provided uh, by the OEM. Uh, you also compare profiles uh, uh, in itself. Uh, if you have deviating profiles uh, from one measurement to the next one, uh, which is also giving you an idea of uh, a, a change uh, in, uh, in or a idea of a deterioration uh, of the system, uh, um, or if it requires more time to complete the changing status, so time is is, is a factor. Um, uh, you will look at command coil current. If the command coil current stay for for a longer time, uh, um, obviously we're talking about milliseconds, uh, but they, this can be very essential. Uh, um, and then also the velocity. If that is slower than the nominal one uh, uh, provided by the OEM, so this is very uh, important that you. Uh, monitor and measure these parameters and compare it uh, uh, among each other or with, with uh, thresholds uh, provided uh, by the OEM uh, and you will be given an information about uh, uh, the healthiness of your circuit, circuit breaker. So the circuit breaker monitoring for that given reasons uh, that I mentioned before is becoming more and more essential. So um, we see that more customers are talking about it uh, uh, and more customers appreciate uh, the support for monitoring systems uh, of, from, of circuit breakers uh, 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 and the contribution to the reliability and safety uh, of the whole GIS and the kind of whole transmission system because imagine what happens uh, uh, if if the case happens that you have a short circuit and the circuit breaker is not functioning, which unfortunately has happened uh, um, to some of the transmission grid operators in the past. SF6, the whole GIS is full of SF6, even though nowadays uh, suppliers are coming with alternative gases, uh, but uh, the, by far the majority uh, is still SF6. Uh, uh, comply, uh, uh, supplied in all compartments uh, of the GAS. So also here there is uh, 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 the idea of, of customers uh, to monitor each and every single compartment uh, um, uh, in order to avoid also here unexpected failures due to loss of pressure um, uh, inside of a chamber. Uh, which then can also lead to a failure. Uh, also here they are looking into optimization of the maintenance strategy. So why it touching somewhere a chamber if it's not uh, necessary, just because it's planned. Uh, you can do probably sometimes more damage uh, if you are going for a plant maintenance uh, on something which is still in a good condition, rather than if you just go, if you identify and see that there is some issue going on there. 
And then more and more important, of course, also the environmental awareness uh, so associated with the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which is not also not to be neglected uh, um, in, in, in that case. So this is something which customer drives uh, for more uh, monitoring also of the SS6. Uh, and I'm talking about each and every gas chamber. Uh, so we have been involved in monitoring projects uh, uh, leading up to almost 200 uh, or even beyond 200 uh, um, gas chambers to be monitored um, in one uh, GIS switch gear. Usually it's, uh, it's centers provided uh, by suppliers like Trafak or Vika uh, who are monitoring the density um, and which are then integrated into the complete uh, monitoring system. Uh, where then you get individual outputs uh, uh, on, on gas density or gas pressure uh, related to a temperature here in that case. Also here, uh, it monitors the parameters uh, staying within uh, a limited bandwidth. And so if it is somewhere going out of the bandwidth of that uh, thresholds and leaving the thresholds or exceeding the thresholds, um, and a warning or uh, an alarm will be given. So you measure uh, the trends, you measure the density, uh, basically you have alarm status and system status information uh, available uh, who give you the chance uh, to react uh, uh, at a very early stage uh, um, as soon as something is going out the thresholds. Uh. And the measurements are taken on a periodic basis, uh, so are not related to any kind of open or close commands or whatever other events uh, uh, associated uh, where they are completely independent from these events. The complete monitoring system then should give you an idea of um, the whole system at a glance. So ideally, you have a system in front of you in the central room, which provides you all the information about the status uh, uh, and giving you, first of all, an overview uh, about uh, your, your asset uh, under monitoring uh, by just the traffic light concept there, so that you have uh, red, uh, yellow, green, uh, uh, which indicates you the performance uh, of the system. Uh, and so as long as everything is in green, uh, uh, you will have no issues, uh, but uh, if you get a first traffic light, a yellow light, uh, or even a red light, you know that you have some issues. Uh. So the T-SCADA of, uh, of uh, TechM provides uh, such an HMI, uh, which is also capable to integrate any kind of any other third-party information in that substation, so that you are able even also to correlate data uh, with PD data, um, which gives you even a more precise uh, evaluation of uh, the activities. At the same time, it allows also exporting information into a SCADA system uh, of the 61850 level. There. So on a, on a dashboard, uh, you would have, uh, first of all, an asset view, who, which gives you an overview about the current status. Uh, I talked about the traffic light uh, concept. So red, yellow, green, uh, and uh, so on uh, On a quick glance, uh, you um, will immediately identify areas uh, where you might have an issue uh, and where you want to take a closer look. At. And so if you identify a red area, uh, you will zoom in uh, and you will find all information about trendings uh, on different parameters. Uh, and by simple track and drop, uh, it allows you to correlate different data uh, which you have uh, uh, in the system. Uh, um, uh, and uh, which might give you an additional idea on uh, uh, reasons uh, for alarms. Uh, and then you can even go further into uh, the activities, uh, for example, like uh, we talked about the, uh, the TF map and the clusterization. Uh, so you would have a PRPD pattern and then different clusters uh, that you can analyze uh, uh, one by one, uh, which then would give you also a better idea of what kind of uh, uh, situation you're facing. 
Also here, the overview, the HMI will give you uh, the idea here of a system that we uh, supplied uh, for a 400 kV substation with 26 bays uh, uh, here for SF6 monitoring. Uh, uh, so then if you find some, some red alarms, uh, you are able to enter into the red alarms. Uh, um, and these red alarms uh, will allow you uh, to uh, uh, identify the failures. Uh, look into then the particular asset like here into the bay uh, give you an idea of uh, uh, what parameters are being measured uh, and what parameters are being critical uh, on the other side you will find uh, detailed information about uh, current status uh, about breaker status uh, uh, and uh, detailed technical information uh, of the particular bay uh, and here in that case, uh, you would find on that bay that there is an issue on SF6 density here, uh, and then you could read the different uh, parameters uh, uh, on the right scale. So uh, it's very important that you have uh, uh, a, a good and easy to read HMI, which provides you on a first glance uh, quick information uh, on what is the issue and uh, that you can take uh, appropriate countermeasures. Um, this time. All right, I think uh, we went uh, pretty quickly through uh, this topic. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, um, each and every point that we could uh, go deeper into, uh, like for example on the TF map, uh, uh, if you have more interest on that, you will find webinars about PD testing and PD monitoring on our homepage. Uh, Please feel free to join also these uh, webinars. Uh, they will focus more in depth uh, on the topic of the TF map and how to apply uh, and the benefits of the TF map and the advantages when it comes to testing and monitoring. Um, and also on uh, the other points like circuit breaker monitoring, uh, we could have separate webinars uh, for hours on that one. Uh, this webinar was intended to give you an, an overview. However, please feel free, I mean, uh, to ask uh, many questions and, and, and to share it uh, with us. Uh, and uh, I think um, uh, I think Mirko is busy answering uh, questions that, that you have been raising. Uh, um, if, if you at a later stage have any questions, uh, please uh, feel free uh, to contact all, us also directly. Um, sales at altanova-group.com uh, you can always find us uh, um, or you find myself uh, at uh, stefan.heber at uh, altanova-group.com so don't hesitate uh, to send us emails uh, to give us calls uh, uh, and to uh, give us more questions um, if if you have uh. All right, uh, so I think we uh, the stage is still open and we leave the stage open uh, for for questions uh, that you have. Uh, 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 I can see that uh, there are a lot of uh, questions in the question box. I'm very happy to see these activities. Uh, um, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Uh, to this uh, and like I said I mean uh, we're happy to continue answering your questions uh, uh, and um, also here in the section uh, for for the next uh, 10 minutes uh, but also if uh, on uh, in by emails uh, you can contact us so thank you very much thanks for your attention <laughs>